Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first foregone webinar, uh, second, sorry, second foregone webinar uh, of the year. This webinar, we've been very excited. It's take, been prepared in being prepared for quite some time uh, as we discuss some of the challenges around uh, networking for educational establishments, so schools, colleges, further education, universities. Um, this webinar is not about teaching you to suck eggs, but more about some of the um, some of the challenges we we've overcome when dealing direct with these kind of institutions, as well as working together uh, with you to help our resellers not only to um, upsell additional equipment and to to work together to uh, provide as much information as possible to uh, colleges and schools and other educational institutions, but also uh, to give you an idea of actually what are we talking about as a distributor of this equipment? What are we? What conversations are we having? Uh, with educational establishments. So uh, we'll kick off uh, with the uh, webinar now. Um, let's move on to the second slide. So just a, a brief agenda uh, from us. Obviously, I'm going to give you a quick welcome uh, and an introduction to myself and Russell, uh, who's going to be uh, presenting a lot of the uh, technical breakdowns today. And we're going to discuss why do schools actually need uh, integrated Wi-Fi and the latest smart technology. We're going to talk about some of the common challenges in schools. We're going to discuss what does a future proof smart school actually look like. We're then going to highlight some of the key Ubiquiti products and other brands as well uh, that can be used in schools as a good technical future proof solution. We're going to talk about how you would build an integrated networking and communication solution. And that's going to include some networking diagrams uh, of small, medium, large and extra large style solutions that you could consider. And then we're going to do a little Q&A at the end. Now, of course, you can. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar with um, the click meeting technology that we use for our webinars, you've got a little chat box on the right hand side where you can pop questions. I will be making note of as many questions as I can throughout the meeting and we'll come back to those at the end. There will be opportunities for you to contribute to the discussion as well. Um, so if you've got any points uh, or any experience around in conversations with, with schools or education establishments around networking, we'd love to hear from you. Please feel free to put that in the text box uh, and we can uh, build a discussion around this and hopefully uh, we can learn some new things as well together. So, a little bit of an introduction to me. My name is Jamie Lawrence. I'm the sales manager here at Forgone Solutions. Uh, I've been with uh, Forgone now for 18 months, joining in February last year. So I'm a, a true uh, COVID colleague. I've been here pretty much throughout the entire COVID period. And hopefully uh, that period, I know whilst it's been challenging for a lot of you, uh, hopefully um, you guys have, have pulled through and we're all, all good and we're really ready to accelerate on as we uh, escape those challenging times. So um, as I say, I'll be the sales contact for you all. And I would like to hand over to Russell to introduce himself. Hello everyone, so I'm Russell King. I've been with Foregone Solutions for around about seven and a half years now. I'm the technical support manager. I've been with the company for about, well, like I say, seven years, seven and a half years. I've been specializing in ubiquity products for most of that time. I assist customers through our premium support provision as well as advising on pre-sales advice to assist with building solutions for customers. Um, and I've been a Ubiquiti certified trainer for Air Max and Unified products for several years now as well, um, just training our uh, customers essentially how to use equipment and get them certified. Very well uh, qualified to to be talking about this te the technology today. Um, oh, <laughs> absolutely. So a little bit about Foregone. Now, again, I know a lot of you will already be familiar with us, but for anyone that's reasonably new to the business, we've been, we're founded in 2010 and we are a truly global distributor of wireless networking equipment. We do offer the latest industry leading products. Um, obviously, we're primarily a Ubiquiti distributor, but we also supply um, other enterprise networking brands such as Aruba, Meraki and Ruckus. Um, we are truly vendor agnostic. So whilst today this webinar is going to be quite heavily focused around Ubiquiti and some of the Ubiquiti products, um, and we're going to talk about why that's going to be shortly, uh, we are truly vendor agnostic. So we'd always recommend what's right for our customers. Um, Russell leads our technical support division and we have an expert technical support team available for all of our resellers to benefit from. Um, and a lot of you will already be beneficiaries of our industry leading reseller program and trade pricing program. Um, a lot of you will know already about our, our deals and support available to, to you as resellers um, and the support we offer all large scale project projects um, and next day shipping is standard. Nice little, uh, nice little bonus there for working with us. So 
let's kick things off. Why do schools require integrated Wi-Fi and smart technology? Well, I'll um, I'll hand over to Russell for this one, uh, and he can talk a little bit more about his conversations with educational establishments and what that looks like for us. Yeah, so fundamentally, infrastructure needs to be built to quickly and efficiently allow the collection and sharing of information. I mean, that's what schools are really about. There has to be a focus on control over these, as well as other services like security and, and safety in mind. Uh, to name a few, enhanced communication, uh, understanding requirements, not only logically, but also in dynamically changing environments. The ability to access with permitted guidelines within the minimum delay across both wired and wireless network connections. What and who are accessing this and what technologies are used to access them? Um, I'll give you some examples. Uh, local storage systems, uh, so NAS and SAN, uh, remote users, uh, whether it be VPN or, uh, uh, for example, webinars um, uh, are used a lot more we see in, in schools. Uh, visitors, presentation devices, uh, to give uh, an overview, just seamless connectivity across multiple platforms. All this is required to provide content that is shared intuitively for access to curriculum and knowledge bases. Um, so for those of you who don't know very much about IoT and BYOD or what those mean, um, I'm sure most of you do, uh, BYOD or bring your own device. These are devices that are brought in by um, external people, for example, uh, students, visitors, or even internal uh, like staff. Um, they require access to the network and, and you have to consider security and, um, and privacy information there as well. And IoT, so Internet of Things, which are externally integrated systems, for example, smart whiteboards, um, required emergency systems like secure access and fire infrastructure, and it has to be visibility and secure access uh, to which are crucial. Perfect. So I think we should look at probably before we go into the nitty gritty, what actually are the, are the common challenges faced in schools? Now, I, I'd love for anyone in, in in the webinar, any of our attendees to really contribute to this. So but feel free to put some uh, put in a chat box if you've uh, encountered any common challenges that are, we haven't talked about here uh, within educational establishments. But similar key things and key uh, uh, challenges we come up against when, we, when we're discussing with schools and what they approach us with is the sheer number of users. So that could be students, teachers and management, but that can also be guests, uh, whether that be uh, people coming into for, for the service on site, whether that could be a guest speaker. It could be all sorts uh, of different people. And as Russell alluded to on the previous slide, it's about keeping uh, different layers of security for, and different tiers of security for different types of uh, user. Um, now, historically, a lot of schools, I know this, there are some exceptions to this rule, but a lot of schools are built in very old buildings. They've been established for a very long time, uh, and therefore these buildings were not designed to host uh, networking uh, or networks. They're not, don't, not designed to facilitate networking. Um, so a lot of the time, uh, there's a lot of very slow connectivity speeds between multiple locations and buildings. Now, you could have a very powerful fixed line into one building but it's about getting that network across the school and obviously schools are made up of lots of little buildings as well um, so a lot of challenges around the slow connectivity speeds there um, also uh, I know it's been a little while since I was in school but I couldn't have even dreamed of having connectivity in, in open spaces but now this is a more an increasingly common requirement playgrounds school playing fields and other areas are all required to have coverage uh, and that is a real challenge that we're coming across right now that's probably a more recent concern for a lot of our uh, education customers. Visitor access and internal external security. When I was in school visitor access was determined by ringing a bell. Things have moved on. It's about controlling who has access, where they have access to, locating where a guest or a visitor is in school for security purposes and ensuring that security, including CCTV and other monitoring systems are in place. Now, all of this is really important, but primarily budget constraints. We're hearing increasingly in the news about how there's funding shortages, cutbacks uh, for education, and it's about providing these education customers with the latest technology, but challenging when it comes to their budgets. Now, historically, a lot of education customers have used enterprise networking gear, such as Meraki, Aruba, and Ruckus. Now, these are great products with their own USPs, unique to those brands, and they're really, really powerful solutions. 
but they're also extremely costly solutions. And I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with those solutions as well. And we are seeing an increasing number of education customers coming to us with either end of life or older uh, ruckus or Aruba or Meraki equipment looking for a more cost effective alternative. And we're going to come on to those solutions in a bit more detail later. And then finally, whilst schools do have a lot of technical expertise in house, it's about balancing that with the technical experience and ongoing maintenance and support of the latest equipment, making sure that there is a full and complete understanding within the education environment around how this equipment works and how it can benefit them. And again, feel free to share if you've come across any other uh, challenges and we can perhaps pick up on those uh, a little bit later on. So what does a future-proof school actually look like? Now, I'll, again, I'll hand over to, uh, to Russell to, uh, to talk about this one in a bit more detail. Yes, so it needs to be interconnected. You have to have a bit of aggregation um, of services and solutions in there. So we are in a te technology-driven revolution where all devices are interconnected, uh, from printers to cooking equipment to speakers, and it all has to be controlled from an app. Uh, people in business are always in demanding the latest technologies and innovations, um, and uh, the industry has to keep up with that. Keeping on top of this is the biggest challenge in our industry. Uh, we need to minimize the effort and time spent on managing and scaling technologies, which is a priority while maintaining redundancy and security. Uh, to give you an example, Unify Access Point utilization performance metrics viewed at a glance inside the Unify controller. This allows for smart and efficient scaling of networks. Um, if you know how, how busy a specific access point is, if it gets too busy, then you need to put in another one in, in or, or change the model to, to suit the environment. Uh, Unify Access uh, integration with Unify Protect, which is a CCT solution, um, will allow control over security all under one roof. Um, so these are kind of examples of what we can do to essentially keep things moving and um, and, and and grow uh, uh, grow a school uh, in terms of its technologies. Fantastic. So. so um, yeah, oh, I was going to say we're going to move on. I know there's been a question in the chat about specific scenarios for um, for schools and running through what equipment would be required. So we're going to talk about now a, a few of the um, products that are very popular with our education customers that we're finding now. This again, this isn't going to be uh, a complete recommendation. These are just some ideas to give you what sort of conversations and products we are talking about with our uh, with our education customers and potentially what you should be talking about with your education customers too. Okay, so top products that could be used in schools. Um, I'm going to give you some, some examples. And I know a lot of you will probably be aware of Wi-Fi 6 access points coming to the market. Um, they are very new technologies, and obviously we're very excited to start providing them um, as, as and when they come out. The uh, Wi-Fi 6 is not hugely supported by all devices yet, so um, we're still looking at the, um, the Wi-Fi 5 solutions. Uh, specifically in this case, uh, the HD access points from Ubiquiti. Um, those are the Wave 2 AC access points. Um, they have uh, their place uh, well above the AC access points, mainly because they support high concurrency and throughput. Um, this is through uh, multi-user MIMO, um, better performance uh, from the chipsets on them, uh, as well as having more antennas on them so they can deal with more uh, more coverage areas. So HD access points provide high density de uh, connectivity via AC Wave 2. It offers multi-user communication, um, which is very, very important. It always used to be a single user MIMO with the AC access points, which were around from, since 2006. In the last couple of years, we've seen a massive growth in the HD uh, access point uh, sales, uh, especially in schools, which is very, very encouraging for us because we know what they're capable of. HD access points typically have better antenna design, like I mentioned before. Um, they're usually four by four antenna designs. Um, when we talk about antenna design, uh, we talk about things like uh, high gain. Um, this is a provision through uh, antenna aperture, or how, basically how big the an antenna coverage area is in, physically inside the access point. Uh, with four by four, you have uh, extra antennas in there, which basically allows for increased range over the predecessors because it allows them to listen to clients from further distances. Now with Unify access points, they're all power of Ethernet. 
um, essentially allowing the dev device to be powered and receive and send data over a cable, over a single cable. This reduces cable requirements if migrating from non-PoE access points. Uh, essentially, if you have a PoE switch or uh, even PoE ejectors in a separate location, all you need to do is run a single cable to the access point, which reduces the strain on installation costs. Now, in terms of keeping things simple and easy to um, configure, uh, with Unify Access Points, you can upgrade, take control of, and apply a basic configuration to a Unify Access Point ready to use within a single click uh, from the Unify Controller interface. It makes creating and scaling networks very easy, and um, if the, the visual, visualization tools of all the devices on your network means that you can configure them very, very quickly um, and do your tweaking to make sure they, they run at their, essentially their best, uh, at their best performance. Uh, Russell, I know we talked about having a Q&A at the end, but there's just a very quick question here from Mark around explaining what MIMO is and what the advantages are. Absolutely. So MIMO stands for multi-in, multi-out. Um, this is essentially uh, with relation to how many antennas there are on the on the access point. So a single access uh, uh, we talk about uh, streams essentially. Uh, with the older technologies in Wi Fi, you see uh, single antenna designs where essentially you can have one stream of information going between the access point and the, and the client. Um, you can add multiple streams through different polarizations, which is basically um, making a, a, having a difference between different signals uh, coming from different antennas. If you can somehow separate those, from the client and the access point, then you can send multiple uh, streams of data at the same time. Now, the uh, with single user MIMO, it always used to be the case that you could only have one device talking over the multiple streams to the um, to the client and vice versa at the same time. With multi-user MIMO, uh, the technology has been increased with um, uh, Wave 2 compatible devices at least to basically split up those streams. So the access point can intuitively say, right, well, I have one uh, device that's a two by two. I have another device that has um, a two by two, which is essentially two antennas. We can uh, set, I'm a four by four device. I have four antennas. I can use two of those antennas to talk to one client and another one to talk to the other client simultaneously. Um, it doesn't work the other way around with the client talking to the access point, unfortunately, because uh, the client doesn't have to talk to other clients. It only ever talks to the access point. But the access point certainly can talk to multiple clients at the same time, and that gives you an improvement in performance. So ultimately, improved concurrency, basically, and performance across multiple users. Correct, yes. Hopefully that answered your question, Mark. Um, so we'll move on now to um, uh, the next, next step of uh, what products can be used in schools. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, if you have a unify uh, a, a PoE switch, then you can power multiple access points and have uh, data going to them. Um, this slide discusses switches in a bit more detail, uh, especially with unify USWs or unify switches, which are the generation two uh, switches from Ubiquiti. Uh, they allow for connectivity between devices, which we'll be talking a little bit more about later on. Uh, I'm also talking about the UDM Pro, which is a new device from Ubiquiti. Um, well, relatively new, it's been around for about a year now. Um, with the UDM Pro and the USW Pro, they allow for 10 gigabits LAN and WAN capabilities. Uh, 10 gigabits per second networking is fast becoming the standard model for core networking. Um, hopefully we'll see uh, more of an edge towards uh, end user networking as well at 10 gigabits per second. Um, although many services, uh, internal services like NASA and Sun are using 10 gigabits now. Uh, for a lot of the time, you need to have access to performance metrics, and it needs to be, and, and you can complete these at the physical device now with the generation two Unify switches. So um, I don't know if you can see on the slide, but on the left hand side of each switch, uh, in the generation two and on the UDM Pro as well, you have a touch screen. Um, the touch screen allows for you to basically physically see what's going on on the switch while you're at the switch. So, for example, if you're trying to troubleshoot an issue that's um, maybe, you know, intermittent or uh, you're trying to see uh, real-time information without having to be at your desk, you can go to the cabinet, open the cabinet up, uh, look at your switch and then scroll through uh, the, the display to see exactly what's happening with the switch uh, in terms of its own performance as well as how uh, clients are doing to the port level. 
so there's a lot of uh, competitive information you can get from these uh, without actually having to have uh, be in front of your physical desk. The, if you have an iOS device, you can use the augmented, augmented reality function as well. So with augmented reality, it's an app that you basically scan the, um, the switch's display or UDM's display. Um, there's a pattern on there that helps the um, augmented reality app identify that device and then the uh, the camera will show you uh, with an overlay exactly what's on which port uh, and some other information as well so it gives you um, a futuristic um, device identification and um, and, and, and and analysis with the USW pros uh, the 48 and the 24 uh, you have access to 82 do 3 BT power of Ethernet so there's different standards in the 802.3 power of Ethernet um, uh, like classes there's different classes of these essentially uh, a lot of you a lot of you will be familiar with the AFNAT so uh, roughly 16 watts and 30 watts of power can be delivered and a lot of most POE devices accept that but we're seeing a lot uh, move to high power devices and especially especially with ubiquity the um, the XG access points, which is the top of the line, and the UWB XG, which is a um, like an outdoor event style um, access point, requires these high powers. But a lot of um, consu uh, you know other devices uh, from other manufacturers require this, these high um, um, high wattage uh, technologies. So you do have uh, 82.3 BT. Uh, for high power devices at uh, Unify switches, uh, Gen 2 switches on the Pro ones as well. Now, TFP Plus on the 24 port switches, I believe is available, and on the 48 port ones, it's available too. Uh, this is for, you can use these for aggregation and call links to provide 10 gigabits per second um, call up links. And even beyond if you're using aggregation, so if you're using switch aggregation, using multiple ports for a single uh, uplink, then you can get up to 20 gigabits per second between switches. Uh, it does allow for media conversion as well. So um, for example, if you're going between two buildings, um, you don't want to be using uh, copper in, in some cases, especially um, uh, since f f uh, cable has uh, copper cable has its own uh, disadvantages. Uh, over long distances, especially outdoor runs, so you have the ability to do fiber, uh, fiber, for example, um, through SFP to do these longer runs, especially if you're doing them over you know multiple hundreds of meters. Now, on the UDM Pro, uh, one of the biggest features that's come out is IPS IDS. I know these are available on the USG and the USG Pro, which are um, uh, security gateways or routers provided on the Unify platform, and they do provide IPS IDS. But with UDM Pro, you get a because it's such a high performance device, you do get line rate um, up to over two and a half gigabits per second on IPS and IDS, whereas they were limited on the the older USG and USG Pro. Uh, these give you enhanced protection from threats entering the network. Uh, think of it like a firewall antivirus. Um, stopping um, security threats from entering your network um, or even existing on your network or passing through your network um, without uh, before you even start thinking about software uh, software security features so this has a massive benefit in terms of um, unsecured devices like BYOD uh, where you want to be protected from BYOD devices so you now have that protection built into the network Russell, we've had a couple of uh, questions on the right-hand side that maybe might be worth covering off now. Um, Matthew's asked, how does the UDM Pro fit with schools, ISPs, filtering and firewalls? Are you still with us, Russell? I do apologize. Yep. Yeah, so with, <laughs> I do apologize, I've somehow muted myself. Um, <laughs> You don't have to use IPS and IDS with the UDM Pro. If you have your own firewall security um, services, I do know of a lot of schools that use, uh, for example, Smoothwall uh, or PFSense or you know, their own um, VMs um, or even appliances that manage your own security. You don't have to use IPS and IDS. Uh, you can use those and it will just sit in line with, with the network. Um, IPS and IDS is there to provide enhanced protection from threats from entering the network, and it gives you a bit of customization in there as well. What about the um, 
speed restrictions using IPS IDS with the UDM Pro? Yeah, so I mean, this information is available on the Bixi website. That's essentially with the USG, the, the original three-port um, gateway, it was restricted down to 85 megabits per second um, throughput from the WAN to the LAN. Um, the reason for this is because it has to do characterization sorry, characterization of the data that's passing through, um, and that is very intensive on the CPU. Uh, with the USG Pro 4, it would be around about 250 megabits per second because it's slightly more powerful device, but it's certainly um, it's st certainly still a limit there. With the UDM Pro, because the uh, the processor and the, the hardware inside the UDM Pro is that much more powerful, um, you do get up to maybe two and a half gigabits per second with IPS IDS switched on. Um, from what I hear, um, with IPS IDS switched on, it also removes um, hardware offloading for some of the other features like uh, um, deep pack inspection, uh, which can slow things down. But even then, the UDM Pro really smashes it in terms of, of, of throughput performance over its predecessors. Um, Blagomir, we're going to come back to your question at the end, just so we can keep to time. Um, but please keep that in mind. We won't, we won't, we won't forget about you. Um, so on to the next slide um, around uh, security. Yeah, so um, specifically we're going to be talking about Unify Protect. So Unify Protect is essentially an appliance-based CCTV system. Uh, it gives you um, your NVR, your storage, all in one device. It gives you, it allows you the access to remote monitoring uh, uh, and site-by-site -site management as well. So uh, I'll give you an example of the UVC G4 Pro, uh, which is a 4K clarity uh, and long-range IR coverage camera. Uh, these give you uh, a lot of benefit because they allow up to maybe 30 frames per second at 4K. I've seen a lot of examples in schools even now where the, the CCTV systems are not up to scratch and maybe get one frame per second and really low uh, quality footage, you know, 640 by 480 or 800 by 600 lines. Um, to have 4K at 30 frames per second means you can really track down those details. Um, the UNVR. Um, essentially is the uh, NVR system um, that's slightly more powerful in terms of you know providing uh, RAID on the storage side of things so you have four hard drive bays and then you can put RAID 5 on them to give you a bit of uh, a bit of uh, security and um, redundancy over uh, hard drive failures which is quite, quite, it's pretty common in you know high uh, throughput uh, scenarios like CCTV. Um, now, with Unify, um, Unify Protect and Unify Networks on the UDM Pro and on the Cloud Keys as well, which we'll maybe discuss a bit further down the line, this is all available um, via single sign-on. So if you're using cloud services for your remote monitoring, you do want to be able to control the uh, network sometimes as, as well as uh, your Unified Protect system and, and have access to both, mainly because they go, kind of go hand in hand. They're both IP devices. Um, one uh, is the uh, sharing of data and the other one is just the collection of it. So you do want to be able to control both to manage uh, throughputs as when you're you know dealing with uh, scale, scaling a network or you know administering it, making sure that the, the dynamics of the um, you know, dynamic, dynamically changing the scenarios are managed. So having the control over both in under one roof, under single sign-on. Now to, to explain how uh, the cloud single sign-on works, uh, essentially you, uh, Ubiquiti has uh, something called account.ui.com, which is essentially a single sign-on cloud service. Uh, it's kind of app-based. So if you have a unified controller, for example, you can manage it via your, your, your cloud access with, uh, with Ubiquiti. But you can do the same with Unify Protect as well. Um, with a single sign-on, as long as they're both managed on the Ubiquiti cloud, you just sign on to a single account and then you have access to both and then some. Uh, you can also give other people permissions to have access to these, to, to the Unify Control and Unify Protect. Um, and the, the permission structure allows you to manage how they connect to those as well. So for example, if you want to give people view any access to your, your cameras, you can do that by the by single sign-on permissions. Uh, but it's on a, a 
a appliance base basis. So if you have, a, for example, a UDM Pro that you want to only to be able to manage the, the network side of things, uh, and you have a UNVR that's only for the CCTV side of things, you don't have to give them access to, to both of those at the same time. You can give them a, a, a specific user access to a single one, like a security person, I only have the need to have access to, do, to Unify Protect. Russell, we've got a couple of questions in here. Um, I believe one of them's already been answered by one of our attendees. So thank you very much about using um, Unify cameras with existing CCTV solutions. Um, we do have a question around Unify Protect and can we explain what RAID levels does the NVR support and how does it work if you have to hot swap a HDD? Yes, yeah, so with RAID, um, essentially you have multiple disks and you can either strike them, I write to all the disks at the same time, or uh, there's, there's several different formats, but one of the common ones is writing to all the disks at the same time, um, and then having some parity in there. So basically some redundant information in, uh, stored on all the disks that allows you to re basically rebuild a disk if it fails. Um, they are SATA drives. Essentially means that hot swap, uh, hot swap capability is in there. Uh, you basically remove the drive that's faulty and then add a new one in, it'll rebuild the RAID array and then you're off to the races. With RAID 1, um, uh, it is writing to all the disks at the same time, um, but it's basically a single copy of the data to each of the other disks, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, that means that you get the maximum storage, but maybe not the same redundancy. Perfect. Now, there was a question in here around how many megapixels the G4 Pro cameras are. I think that was from Kevin. Um, ubiquity, uh, I've had a little look myself. Ubiquity don't actually quote how many megapixels the G4 Pro is. However, I do know that the G4 Bullet, which is a 1440p uh, camera, is a four megapixel sensor. So I, sus I suspect the uh, the G4 Pro will be slightly, uh, uh, slightly more megapixels. But unfortunately, Ubiquity don't quote uh, what that is, unfortunately. Um, Okay, perfect. Thanks for that, Russell. That's, that's a great help. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, some new products that aren't actually available in the UK as of yet. But uh, Russell, if you want to uh, continue. Yeah, so smart access control with uh, Unify Access. So Unify Access, as we've, uh, uh, I think Jamie just mentioned, is not available in the UK as yet, but we hope it's, it's coming soon. It's a basically a, a management uh, a set of devices that allows you to manage uh, you know access to, to buildings at the fundamental level um, you can have security by HDM 4k video and RFID uh, it does integrate with uh, network interfaces um, there's no additional software required, especially if you have the UDM Pro Unify, Unify Access is built into the UD, UDM Pro as, a, as an application you can use. It allows you to basically administer and set access controls, permissions, and, and view log information for specific users entering, the, entering buildings. One of my favorites is the, um, the UA Pro, uh, which is the circular device you can see uh, on the image at the front. Uh, it has a touchscreen user interface it supports rfid and it has video support so it modernizes the user experience and access option op options and it gives you a lot of cosmetic appeal as well imagine walking up to a um, a, a, a door you you've, you've lost your fob somehow you touch this touch screen interface you put in the key code and you're you're in and all that with a microphone and the camera built into the device so um you know security personnel can see exactly where you were when you when you uh, access the building. The UA Hub is basically a centralized controller for that. So it manages inputs and outputs, for example, your door strikes or your automatic locking systems, uh, as well as access to the UA Pro. Um, Ubixi also has the RFID, RFID fobs that you can use alongside it. So it is really, really good, especially with the, um, the statistics and detail logs, which um, has the same kind of format and visual uh, effects as um, the Unify Controller and Unify Protect. It goes along the same kind of lines. So uh, having access to that detailed information is really, really handy. Perfect. Um, there's been some questions around the uni new Unify doorbell. Um, now, whilst that is part of Unify Access, 
Um, we don't have any huge amount of technical information around the doorbell and how that's connected to UK doorbell systems yet. Uh, Ubiquity have delayed the launch of the unified doorbell in the UK. Um, so, Russell, I don't know if you can go into any more, if you've had any further information about that product. I have had a look at it and um, it's very, very easy to integrate. Um, one of the, the, the key benefits of it is that it can use your in your existing uh, copper lines um, to to you know have access to to it in, in digitally, which is really really good because then you can just put it in in place of a, a of an original doorbell without having a network cable and get it and, and get your data out of it. Um, one of the features I really like on it as well is the video, so it's a very very wide angle um, camera on it. Uh, but it doesn't have to be kind of flat face onto the onto the wall that's uh, adjoining a building, for example. Um, it can be mounted at 45 degrees, which gives you better angles to, to view what's going on. And um, obviously, the, the interface gives you a lot more information about, uh, you know, if you're in or not, or if you want to leave a message, for example, um, people leaving shipments at your door, uh, that's very, very handy. For uh, schools, I can imagine that, that would be very, very handy if uh, a class is not in effect yet. You can leave a message saying um, this class is cancelled or, um, you you know, it's been moved to a different building or a different room. I think if students heard that message, there'll be uh, uproar and celebration. Uh, <laughs> class is cancelled. Um, so a quick one for me, Russell. I mean, what, we've gone through a few of the Ubiquity different systems. We've gone through access control, uh, security systems, so CCTV and networking. Why is it really important to have all your systems integrated with one controller? Well, if you think about it with, uh, especially with Unify Access and Unify Protect, you do want to have um, some sharing of information there. An administrator or security personnel would want to have access to, to the smart access systems, as well as having access to the CCTV systems. It just makes intuitive sense. Um, having that all under one roof, basically aggregating those services can be really handy. Now, from the perspective of Unify Network, it is integrated into uh, UDM Pro as well as Unify Access and Unify Protect. And why would you have a, a maybe a network administrator having access to these? It's because if you're troubleshooting the issues um, or you want to monitor how things are going, um, because the data trans, uh, transit for Unify Protect and Unify Access is over the Unify Network, uh, an administrator would want to be able to have access to both to see how they're performing. If you have drops in frame rate or you know drops in camera connectivity, you do want to have uh, someone having access to the um, to the footage or to the to the system to, in order to troubleshoot it. Uh, so having it all under one roof makes sense uh, from that perspective. Fantastic. Okay, uh, let's move on uh, to something slightly different, and I'll let Russell explain. Yes, so um, this is going to be a bit of a first look at Robustel. Robustel um, are basically a manufacturer of 3G, 4G cellular routers. Uh, and now the 5G cellular router, the R5020, is available. Um, in When considering it against schools, we look at the Robustel router, although it could be used as your primary router, we look at it more as a backup and dunsing failover device. Um, it provides cellular connectivity at high speed. Um, very robustly and very reliably. Um, if you were to put this onto your WAN2, for example, on a uh, USG or UDM and you're using failover features there, then basically you have to, it will give you um, that, that robustness for your network. To uh, give you an idea, there's a lot of implications of losing your fixed wireless ac wide access. Um, the, the, the losses could be substantial. For example, attendance systems, communication systems for emergency processes, uh, exam systems. Imagine losing your connectivity on, with an online exam. That would be um, catastrophic. Uh, cross productivity school wide would be affected if you had a fixed uh, wired uh, loss and didn't have any internet access. From a bottom line perspective, even short term loss of connectivity has large scale detrimental effects to school and its students. Uh, so, with uh, devices like the Robust LR5020, for example, as your backup, it's because it's focusing on wireless access. If you connect this to UPS, even in the event of a power failure, um, you still have internet access uh, to your school. 
uh, it will support things like backup for your backup. So it has dual SIM support in there. Uh, so if one of your SIM cards or one of your carriers uh, has an outage, then the second one can take over from that. And that's kind of built in from, you know, the factory defaults, just put the two SIMs in there. If um, they're supported via auto APN for auto automatic connectivity, you connect them up and then you have a network in pretty much seconds. A robust VPN is a is a very very clever feature. So it uses a, a cloud service from Robustel um, to essentially connect your Robustel router to them and then um, manage VPN connections from the cloud. So essentially, you don't have to have a static IP on the router. You can connect to a, a to VPN uh, to the VPN server on the Robustel router without having to worry about having a static IP on your SIM card, which can save costs considerably. It gives you connectivity in how to reach locations. So a lot of, um, for example, village schools won't have particularly great or reliable uh, fixed wide connectivity. So having a, a, a robust cell router in there uh, or cellular connectivity will give you um, will give you the connectivity where you, where it may be harder or, or less reliable to get that connectivity. And in terms of robust tell, um, they don't talk about being uh, robust with um, without lying about it. They are. 100% robust. Uh, the hardware and firmware is rock solid. Uh, they very rarely have any issues. It's intuitive to use. They're very quick and efficient. Uh, the boost up times for robust cell routers is in the long lines of 1 minute 30 to 2 minutes. Um, in contrast to some other manufacturers I know that can take up to 10 minutes to start fully working and even then they have performance degradation. Um, you know, you can get these things up and running very, very quickly. Uh, Robustel's uh, operating system is based on it is an app-based system, so you have the core functionality in there for cellular connectivity, routing, firewall, um, you name it. Uh, but you can add extra features via the App Store on the um, on the RCMS um, Robustel's uh, management uh, cloud in, uh, system. So uh, things like extra functionality like VPN uh, for PPTP or uh, L2TP. Uh, uh, QoS, SNMP, um, they're all apps that you can add on to it. So you basically only use the, the, the router's functions as required rather than bogging it down with uh, all the apps and then just using them optionally. Um, I think it's quite quite an important thing to note that uh, as a business, we have a, a direct uh, relationship with Robustel, a bit like we do Ubiquiti. And we moved premises in uh, in February. Uh, we moved to a new uh, purpose-built office um, and we were promised fixed line connectivity uh, about three weeks later. So for the three weeks, we were not ha didn't have any fixed line connectivity. Our entire operation was being run off of one of these 5G routers, Robusto R5020s. But it was a prototype. It wasn't actually the final product. It was a prototype that Robusto had very kindly sent us. Then, and I think Russell uh, will testify to this because it was quite a frustration for him, our fixed line was delayed. I think it was four months or five months, Russell, am I right? Yeah, five months. So essentially, we were putting in um, uh, fiber and it had to be kind of laid. So imagine diggers outside the office. Um, uh, there were significant delays with that. So, you know, four or five months went by uh, without that connected in. Very, very early on in, the, in, in this process, we put in a robust cell 5G router, the prototype, like you said, and it's been rock solid. We have no downtime on it. Um, the connectivity is, is you know, circa 80 to 100 megabits per second. Um, now, a lot of you will already be aware that 5G technology is obviously capable of a lot more than 100 megabits per second, but um, the, the cellular mass infrastructure um, doesn't allow for higher speeds just yet. But even then, 80 megabits to 100 megabits per second actually surpassed our original fixed wired con connectivity at our previous office. Um, and the latency was lower as well, and we didn't have any downtime on it. Yeah, uh, we, it we, just worked. Yeah, we had we had I think we had twenty five to thirty people at peak uh, operating off of this one product. So uh, you know this is why we we believe it's a great failover option, or as a standalone product for external outbuildings, some bits and pieces like in a school. Um, the benefits of this is obviously we've been in a five G rollout area. Uh, as our office is based in Chelmsford in Essex. However, for those of you that aren't in 5G rollout areas currently, the benefits of using this product are that it has uh, ultra fast 4G technology built into it as well. So you can still use a 4G SIM card and still experience 50, 60, 70 meg megabits per second on the 4G network uh, using the very latest 4G technology. There has been some questions around Robusto, and I can answer a couple of these myself. Um, does it have a mobile operate any mobile operator limits on what SIM card you can use? Now, not specifically, you can use whatever SIM card you like. However, Russell might want to go into a bit more detail around actually, do you, 
about using more specific uh, cellular router SIMs rather than necessarily an off-the-shelf SIM card? Because I think there's some issues with, uh, is it is it fixed and static IPs and bits and pieces, Russell? Perhaps you could go into more detail? Yeah, so the, the big four in the UK, especially uh, Vodafone E02, um, 3, they... Um, for the most part, do not provide static IP or choose static IP. And when you talk about that, we're talking about a public IP address. Um, if you know anything about public and, I, uh, and private IP address ranges, you know that you can't do things like port forwarding across um, uh, a NATed or, or private uh, uh, networks. Now, with um, if you're going to get a static IP address from the big four, um, generally speaking, they'll give you a NAT one. Uh, so it won't be truly public uh, for 90% of cases. Um, they'll basically um, give you network address translation uh, across carry grade NAT, which essentially means that you're getting a, a private IP address for, um, from the carrier and uh, many of the other cellular network users will be getting that as well. And then they aggregate that into a public IP. Um, there are SIM cards out there that you can use uh, as data only SIMs that kind of get around this. So one of our partners, um, uh, provides, for example, the eSIM, which is essentially it's carrier agnostic, but it's across their own cellular network as well, their own APN, which essentially means they can provide public IPs, and not only that, they can they can transport that true public IP across uh, pretty much all four of the major carriers uh, all, and, and and their infrastructure, which means it, but automatically, you know, by extension, it supports all the, you know, the majority of them. The um, the minor uh, carriers as well, like Tesco, Mobile, um, and things like that, they can connect to uh, pretty much any of the a a APNs with some limitations in the UK. Perfect. Um, we'll come on to there's a couple of other questions, but we 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 need to move forward because otherwise we're going to run out of time. Uh, but we'll come back to those other questions at the end. Just a quick one around supplying 4G and 5G data plans. Is the answer is yes. Foregone, as Russell mentioned, just there can supply 4G and 5G data plans to our customers. So uh, we're going to move on now to a little bit more around actual network diagrams and actually how a network might be built. Uh, so I'll hand over to Russell for these. Yes, yeah, so we have several uh, slides discussing different sizes of uh, communication solutions. So this is the smallest one. Um, right at the top, you have your cloud connectivity going to the USG, the three port, like I mentioned before. Uh, so this gives you IPS and IGS. Uh, in this kind of situation, it would be a small school, so the data throughputs are not going to be hugely critical for, um, for, for, for internet connection, maybe 80 megabits per second uh, for VDSL. Uh, obviously, with IPS and IGS turned off, you can get close to full line rate, you no know, gigabits per second, uh, up to a gigabit per second, uh, or close to that. Uh, in this example, we're using a robust R1510, so that's a 4G router uh, for your failover. And that feeds into the Victory Unified Switch Gen 2 uh, USW16 PoE, so it gives you power of Ethernet for up to you know, eight devices and data connectivity there as well. Um, Connected to that is the Unified Cloud Key. So the Cloud Key hosts your controller. They provide uh, deeper network management administration, um, uh, monitoring, uh, you know, cloud access if you need it. Uh, connected would, to this network is, sorry, go on. I was gonna say, would the USG replace the school's existing firewall? That's a key question there. Um, it depends on what firewall services you're looking at. So. I mean, you do have access to IPS and IDS, which will give you um, protection from things like malware and 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 other threats. But um, you do have a, a, a stateful firewall in there as well. So you know, let, layer three uh, port IP based uh, and even protocol based firewalling is available in the USG. So if you want to use it in line with your existing firewall services, for example. Um, you, you know, uh, web content filtering, things like that, you need to use uh, your own. But uh, the USG does provide um, at least basic uh, protection from your net on, on your network. So uh, a bit further down the, the diagram here, we have the Unify APAC Lite dual ac band access points. So these will handle a class fairly well, um, you know, uh, per band. So these are dual band access points. On the 5 gigahertz band, you, you build and manage 30 uh, client devices, no problem. So maybe 60 devices on a, on a single access point uh, at low throughputs, you can handle very, very easily. For a small school, this might be ideal, you know, 20, 25 students per class. It'd be really, really handy um, and very, very useful in those kind of situations. It, again, it is way 
AC Wave 1 technology, so it doesn't support the high density, but it does support the clients, um, which may be enough. Of course, you can change that later if you need to or, or swap it out um, in your solution for HD access points if you identify the need for that. A quick question we've got here, Russell, uh, following on from that previous one about the USG and the existing firewall. If their school was to choose to use an existing firewall, where would it sit if a USG is also used? Um, so from memory, because I don't really deal with a lot of uh, plant-based firewalls, but uh, for, the, for the most part, they are um, two interface devices, uh, sometimes even single interface devices, where the traffic has to flow through that device. So it could sit between the USG and the internet connection, or it can switch. Uh, um, it can sit between the, the core switch in your network and the, the LAN port of the USG. Um, I don't really think it matters which um, but from, from the perspective of uh, if it's a, a routing based firewall, then it would sit between the USG and your internet connection. Um, Perfect. I think that's, uh, that's a solid answer. Looks like we've answered that question. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so for medium scale deployment, uh, again, we're using Ubiquiti Unify and Robustel hardware in this example. Um, the Robustel R5020 5G dual SIM failover router. Again, for a medium sized network, um, medium sized school, so maybe a classical style thing, then you'll have, um, you want to have the high speed connectivity uh, out to the internet. Uh, in this case, we're using the USG Pro 4, so it's a two WAN, two LAN device. This gives you a bit of segregation between your networks as well. Um, so you have your firewall router with failover and load balancing support in there. If you want to do some load balancing, then obviously if you're getting hundreds of megabits per second through your 5G, which may be something you get in the future when um, cellular connectivity on 5G improves, then you know you can improve your um, your internet connectivity and therefore um, you don't get the bottleneck so much. Uh, the Ubiquiti Unify Switch Gen 2 USW 48 POE has been used in this case. So it's a 48 port uh, managed switch. Uh, it gives you that um, uh, management interface on the uh, on the display as well. In this example, we're using the Cloudy Gen 2 Plus. Uh, so this is uh, a Unify Control and Unify Protect in a single device. Uh, so it gives you uh, access to CCTV surveillance at a small scale, maybe five or ten cameras, fifteen if if you're pushing it, depending on what your storage requirements are. Um, Unify Protect cameras, so the G4 Pro, G3 Dome, G3 Flex. So G3 Flex is a really, really great device. Uh, mainly because it's small, it can be put into discrete places um, and, and it's cost effective as well. Uh, the domes are very, very good for, um, you know, maybe classroom or corridor kind of use. And then you have your, your bullets in there like the G4 Pro, which could be outdoor, indoor, uh, long range or you know high security areas where you have to, you've got a bit more range on it uh, not only do you have the optical zoom in there but you have the 4k capabilities which allow you to digitally zoom in on the specific areas uh, very very handy in terms of ubiquity access points i focus really on this one with the nano hd and the flex hd uh, the reason that i've picked these up for this particular slide is that the flex hd provides also get again high density requirements but it's uh, horizontal uh, uh, coverage at increased range so you could put one of these in a the corridor for example or in a large assembly hall at, um, you know and it would provide the coverage so the nano hd is a it's a lower end of the hd range but it will provide coverage for um, you know clusters 30 35 and again because it's high density multi-user mimo you could do streaming in there across multiple clients uh, if required and then uh, yeah that's it Perfect. I think we've got another example of a medium deployment on the next slide as well. So we'll move on to that one. Yeah, so this is an alternative to the um, to, to the last one. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the Dream Machine Pro. So this replaces the, the cloud key. So instead of having the cloud key in there and the USG Pro 4, we're just having it all integrated into a single device, Unified Dream Machine Pro. Uh, you have the eight port switch, which gives you connectivity to end devices. Maybe your services would be connected to that. So uh, printers, servers, etc. You have the robust R fifty twenty there uh, for your failover, and then you have on the this device as well ten gig connectivity on the SFP plus. So you can basically have your, your aggregation or your your downlink to the Unify switch below uh, at ten gigabits, or even twenty, well, ten gigabits per second in this case. 
um because you can't do teaming with the udm pro but 10 gigabits per second down to the core network is going to be very very handy again it's using unified switch 48 poe you don't have to have the cloud key in there um and again you have the unified protect uh, functionality with a single um, hard drive bay for your storage the important to mention the udm pro I don't, those those um eight ports on there aren't poe are they they're just network ports no they're just network ports, but they'll be typically used for your services in a medium uh, deployment. So again, um, virtual servers, uh, printers, uh, things like that. Perfect. And next. So this is going to be more of a large scale deployment option. Um, we've gone back to the Security Gateway Pro 4 in this case, uh, because we're putting the UNVR in at the bottom. Um, again, you have one key connectivity down to your network. Uh, you have the USW aggregation switch, so 10 gigabits per second aggregation. Again, you can use a UDM Pro at the top level if you really want to also supply a different router, but um, in this example, we're using the, the USG Pro 4. So this is an aggregation switch. It provides 10 gigabits per second aggregation capabilities and down to uh, your access switches. Uh, to give you an idea of what that means, essentially you have your eight ports on there, which are 10 gigabits per second SFP plus. Uh, they would be cutted to your access switches. So if you imagine a larger scale campus with multiple buildings, each building would have um, an access switch or multiple access switches that require very high speed connectivity back to the core. That's where you'd use a 10 gig um, SFP plus using fiber, um, ideally you know, multi-mode or single mode fiber. Um, Somewhere near the top of that or in, in one of the buildings, you have the UNVR. It gives you the four drives, as I mentioned before, four drive base with SAT with radius support. So you can do your, your, uh, your failover. And the reason we've kind of brought the UNVR into this is because it's multiple, uh, it may be multiple building campus. You're going to have many more cameras in there, potentially 40 or 50. So UNVR is more than capable of that. And of course, you need the extra um, uh, storage for that, which is uh, what the UNVR will provide. Perfect. So um, there are some really great case studies on the um, Ubiquiti websites. Uh, uh, Rick, we'll come back to your question in just a moment. Sorry, I've only, I only just spotted it. Um, but yes, there's um, a lot of case studies available on the Ubiquiti website. They give you an example of different schools. A lot of them, again, are based in America, primarily as Ubiquiti are headquartered in America. Um, but it gives you an idea of some of the recommendations uh, that we've discussed here being actually implemented into an education institution. So there's some grammar schools and universities there as well that give you some ideas. Now, I'm not going to go through these now, but um, we will share, be sharing the slides out with you and you'll be able to view those in your own time. Alternatively, they are available directly on the Ubiquiti website under case studies. So to summarize, really, I think here, um, building an integrated network and communication solutions, why are they required? We talked about it earlier while we thought they were required. We've come back to it now. Um, the key points that we need to be talking about with schools when we're proposing a solution is security, personal, phys physical or virtual. What is the emergency response? Where, what is the coverage for that response? And um, how, we, how can we view, for example, on CCTV? How are people accessing buildings? Where are those people when they're in the building? All of those functions uh, can be built out through Unify and Ubiquity. Um, the need for schools to have as up-to-date technology as possible to enable the best learning for, for, for children and best education uh, for people. Uh, it's important to make sure every, that schools remain modernised, but also not at significant cost. We now know that the digital world has overtaken the analogue world. It is impossible to do business successfully without utilising these technologies. Um, and also the key, the key fact that R Russell men mentioned very at the very start of this presentation is the centralization, the access to shared resources, but also keeping those shared resources secure. It's really, really important. And Ubiquiti has enabled that through their technology. Um, so really, really important one, that one. So as we begin to wrap up, obviously there's been a lot of information here, a lot of technical jargon that we've been through. I know a lot of you as our resellers would already be familiar uh, with a lot of what we've discussed today but if there is any queries or anything you're not sure about or you are looking at purchasing this equipment or you do have a project coming up um, for a, an education establishment and you want our guidance and support you can reach us either via our website 
or on email and we'd be more than happy to help you. And again, you can reach through to the sales pe people uh, and my team uh, by calling us. Uh, the number is here. You can reach us and it, as soon as you press option one, you'll come through to the team and myself or somebody else will be available to help you. Um, so we're going to come on to now to our Q&A. Now, there are some questions I do want to cover. We'll go we'll start from the bottom and work our way up. Um, Rick asked uh, Russell, based on our last diagram, uh, the USW aggregation, is that just a 10 gigabit core switch? So as it's core, yes, um, you can use SFP with it. So um, it does have com backwards compatibility with um, uh, one gigabit um, SFP modules, uh, and you can also um, tune down the um, the, the, the modules. For, for example, the uh, UFRJ45, so it's a 10 gig um, UFRJ45. You can just turn that down to one gigabits per second and get your uh, one gigabit per second connectivity to uh, uh, let you know, one of the first version switches if that's what you want to do, or even uh, just a standard switch if you're not using SFP on it. But yeah, essentially, it is a 10 gigabits core switch. Going back to the slide around when we were talking about the robust 5G router, uh, Russell, um, I've got a question here from Andrew Soden. Uh, we use PepLink to bond across multiple WAN, including SIM. Will the robust Dell do this as well? Um, currently not. So you can't do bonding on the um, robust Dell routers. But if you already have PepLink uh, where you are, then there's no reason why you can't use it as a, for example, a, a LAN interface on the on the robust tail to feed into your peplink router and uh, you do the bonding through there instead because um, it will support uh, bridging across the uh, cellular connection so if you have the ability to bond over the wired connection on your your peplink then there's no reason why you can't use the the 4g router the robust tail router to do that for you perfect um now we had a question earlier on when we were talking about the um, udm pro uh, Blagomir asked, many people prefer to use PFSense instead of the UDM, et cetera, and Unify AP switches. What's your opinion on that? And he's also followed up with, would you add PFSense before the UDM and build your network in Unify? So PFSense is more focused on you know, the security side of things. So the UDM is a, is at its core, a router. Um, um, and and you know you know router switch and, and controller is you know the f the firewall side of things is is going to be a feature of that whereas you, the with PFSense firewall and 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 um, and, con and network control and security is basically what the P uh, PFSense device is or even a firewall appliance so most of the time while you do have the functionality in there for the UDM it's not going to be all the functionality you can't go you go into a huge amount of detail on the um on, on things like web content filtering or IPS IDS you can do a lot of things with it a lot of um uh, make, make lots of changes to to the configuration to kind of uh, you know customize it but with appliances like uh, smoothwall pfsense the, the customization is you know almost comprehensive so i mean for the time being i would probably suggest using both um one to provide connect uh, um you know, protection over a small network if you don't have an appliance-based system, or in addition to it, if um, if you want to benefit from from IPS IDS and then web content filtering in the general form that UGM provides it. Perfect. Um, we've got some more questions following on from the uh, USW aggregation. Um, we've got Rick asking, what kind of redundancy is afforded with these? He's asking around dual PSUs, etc. Is that something that the USW aggregation offers? So, from what I understand, the the generation two switches, the USWs, they have um, uh, like a, a backplane to them that provides an alternative power source. Um, you can use the um, uh, the Ubiquiti uh, redundant power supply RPS, uh, USP RPS, I think it's called, um, which basically it allows two. Um, power supplies two redundant power supplies to be provided so you may have one for example a, a, a large ups uh, or generator that's providing this thing a, a power socket and then your standard wall socket for the other and usp rps essentially uh, aggregates those two and then provides uh, connectivity secondary connectivity to your devices via its um its, uh, its own cabling because in the back of the uh, uh back of the usw so you do have power redundancy there through that there is a redundancy device coming out soon as well that has its own um, battery from ubiquity so it is like a ups for your network got a question here from um, 
from Pete asking about how many concurrent users can connect to those uh, the HD APs. Now, I know this is a bit of a contentious one because uh, it's, it is going to vary depending on the installation and what the users are doing. But Russell, give us an idea on the difference perhaps between maybe a, a UAPAC Lite or LR and the maybe the HD APs in terms of concurrency and, and how many concurrent users. Yeah, so with AC technology, um, the AC Wave 1, Generally speaking, the, the theoretical limit is 127 clients per radio. So for the most part, the AC access points from Ubiquiti, like the European ACLR, for example, is a dual band access point. It supports 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. It's 127 clients each. So it's going to be around about uh, 250 clients per radio. That's theoretical. If you're going to have um, that many, then you're go probably going to be experiencing very low uh, throughput speeds, aggregate, aggregate uh, through at speeds on the device. I'd probably suggest with the AC Wave 1 to so limit it to maybe 30 to 50 clients, depending on the, the model. Uh, in contrast with the HD access point, I think it's up to 250 uh, clients per radio, so you get to 500. And um, obviously, multiple radios you'll get um, for the larger models as well, where they have a bit more support. You maybe get, you get to, into the thousands of marks when it, uh, you have 500 to 1,000 clients, depending on which model you go for in the extremes. Um, again, limiting this. Um, maybe to be about one fifth is is probably uh, what I'd say as a benchmark. Um, you know, a hundred clients for an HD access point, or even the XG um, would be two hundred or three hundred. Uh, the main reason for this is because the more clients you connect to the device, the more traffic uh, you have management traffic going across the RF, and therefore it really bogs things down and slows it down dramatically. Um, but yeah, those serious limits are there, and they do work. But it's just I don't know how much experience you'd have um, if you get to those limits. OK, um, so we're getting to our last question now. So if anyone else has any questions, do feel free to get them typed out. Um, otherwise, this will be our, our final question for Russell. Um, we've got actually it's a question I can potentially answer this one. We're talking about what warranties are afforded with Ubiquiti gear and swap outs. Um, so in terms of Ubiquiti's manufacturer's warranty, it's a, it's a standard one year manufacturer's warranty. Um, with regards to support and other bits and pieces, now Ubiquiti don't support uh, clients directly. Uh, however, as their uh, master distributor in the UK, uh, as Russell mentioned at the start, we are um, fully certified to support Ubiquiti in full through our premium support service. Uh, Russell manages uh, our premium support service, and a lot of you may have already dealt and spoken with him previously on our premium support platform. Uh, Russell, you might want to go into a bit more information about what that entails, uh, but primarily, you know, for anything to do with Ubiquiti, we can conduct uh, we conduct regular training sessions uh, in Chelmsford to certify. Uh, our resellers, as well as we do on-site courses as well, uh, where Russell will actually be in attendance and train your team. Russell, do you want to go into a bit more detail about uh, the premium support function? Yeah, sure. So with premium support, I generally try to frame it as coaching sessions or training sessions. I try to give resources to people um, to, to basically better their knowledge uh, on specific subjects. A lot of the premium support that we get, uh, which is basically on an hourly basis, essentially it's engineer's time, my, my time to talk to, to you and to talk about your network and to, to, to provide information, key information to either improve it or troubleshoot it. Um, a lot of the time you may have issues with, for example, throughput or clients not being able to connect and things like that. And there's going to be some reason for that. You just have to be able to isolate that and understand it. From the perspective of ubiquity, um, specifically, the technology can be a little bit daunting. You don't know where to look, especially with the new user interface on the unified controller, which a lot of you will already be aware of. Um, it's hard to kind of navigate around and understand exactly what's going on with your network. Um, so with the premium support, what I try to do is basically Um, how that kind of relates to the settings and the configuration that you have on your network and then you know suggest the improvements there to to, to make it better um, and uh, that's where I think we're going along with this kind of question is that for the most part uh, new people to ubiquity don't have a huge amount of knowledge about the infrastructure and there's not a lot of documented documentation or easy to find documentation for ubiquity um, so setting up from a front, uh, from a basic level and then really starting to tweak it you need to know where those functions are and that's what I would try to provide and, and do it fairly successfully um, for, for our customers is to to provide them the knowledge and the support to be able to manage their own network but also understand the network and what to look for perfect okay um, I 
think we've got a question regarding um, the lead times. A lot of you will be aware currently about quite significant lead times and challenges uh, on stock sourcing for a lot of uh, Ubiquiti products, as well as other brands as well. Um, so, Chris, just a, an update for you on that uh, from a sales perspective. We're doing everything we can um, to, to get a, a good supply of Ubiquiti equipment. Unfortunately, it is a case that Ubiquiti are primarily focusing their attentions on the US and EU supply. Uh, what we as a business are proactively doing currently is sourcing stock uh, in some cases, additional cost to us um, from uh, EU sources so that we can, can keep our customers supported with, with stock. Now, that's not always possible in some cases. Sometimes products just aren't being supplied at all globally. Um, examples of those products currently are the US 860 watt switches, uh, as well as some others. Uh, the US W24 POE is another example of that. We're doing everything we can. Um, in the meantime, what I would recommend doing is give the sales team a call uh, on the number on your screen ending in 0295, option one for sales team. Um, you'll come through to us and we'll be able to advise you straight away of, of stock levels, uh, where we believe lead times are. Now, we don't get given information around lead times from Ubiquiti, but we can give you a good estimate. Uh, and if we don't know, we'll explain to you that we don't know and we'll try and find some alternatives for you. Now, with regards to uh, other brands, we know that a lot of brands such as Netgear, uh, Cisco um, uh, and others are all struggling uh, and it's not just uh, those brands as well. We're seeing uh, on our sister company, Voipon, similar lead times on some high high density Voip equipment as well. So it is a, a global challenge at the moment. We'll keep doing everything we can, but please feel free to give us a ring anytime you need to. Uh, you've got a project, I would say, prior to perhaps scoping the project so we can give you an idea of what lead times you might expect for the equipment you desire. And of course, if you do have a project and you want to discuss it with us, give us a quick call and we'll help you scope and price and make sure you're, you uh, have it, all the resources you need to uh, support. So. Hopefully you all enjoyed uh, the webinar. You can take a lot away from it. Now, I'm sure there'll be plenty uh, more questions. I can see some people are, are still typing. So I'll keep I'll keep this page active for another couple of minutes while we wait for any last minute questions. But other than that, thank you very, very much for um, for attending today. Very much appreciated. And uh, as I say, any questions, do feel free to give us a call. And thank you very much, Russell, as well. No problem. I hope you all enjoyed it.